Hello and welcome to the Isle of Man, land of the three-legged man, tailless cats, the more the do, the talking mongoose and the fairies or themselves. My name's Richard Felix and I'm going to take you on a haunted tour of this fascinating island. Legend has it that the Isle of Man was formed when an Irish giant called Finn McCull was fighting an invading Scottish giant. McCall drove him off and threw a large boulder after him. It fell short of Scotland and landed in the Irish Sea. And thus the Isle of Man was formed. Most renowned of all giants is Manannan. He is said to throw his cloak of mist over the island in time of danger. The Manx people lived mainly as fishermen, farmers and crofters, and old methods and beliefs lived on, thus influencing the island's character and its traditions. The origins of the emblem of the Isle of Man are dim and shrouded in mystery. It is believed that a King of Scotland brought it here from Sicily. The meaning of the three-legged man is symbolic to Manxman, meaning, whichever way you throw me, I will stand. To help me in my quest, I've enlisted the help of the two founder members of the Manx Paranormal Society, Alan Shaw and uh, Barry Quilliam. Um, gentlemen, um, you're probably the best two people to actually take me on a, on a ghost tour of the island because you, you both do ghost tours. Alan, you, you've been doing them for a while, I believe. Four years now in Peel, yeah. Right, and, and Barry? We just started a new one here in Castletown. And you're also planning on doing a, a Douglas one, yeah, I, I believe. Douglas, yes. um, but I mean, we've got more than, than just ghosts, have we not, here on the island? Oh, we've got gruesome murders, talking mongoose, white ladies, green ladies. Oh my gosh. So we've got an awful lot to go. We've got three days of packed with, with paranormal activity. Yeah. And so come on, tell me where, where is the best place to start? Probably the best place would be to start here would be at Castle Rush behind us. Really? Well, you know what we need to do, don't you? Drink up. Let's go find some ghosts. Okay. Situated at the heart of the ancient capital, Castletown, this impressive limestone fortress was the seat of the former kings and lords of man, the castle's oldest part dating back to the time of Magnus, last Norse king of man, who died here in the castle in 1265. We're inside the castle, main entrance here. Ghost story? Yes, the woman in black. She is often seen on wet, stormy nights. When this was garrisoned, by soldiers, they would actually guard this area here. And on wet, like I say, on wet stormy nights, she would actually appear walking down this corridor and through out into the street. She's also been seen out in the street. But the main one was about 20 years ago when a member of staff had locked up the castle and was actually coming out here. Now, he thought a member of the public had actually been locked in and he went to say to her, hey, love, you want to get out of the wet and the rain when she disappeared through those doors. The only thing was, the doors were locked. Oh boy, that's a nice start. A nice start to a very haunted castle. Great. Now Barry, we're actually on the highest part of Castle Russian. It's a bit windy up here, um, and we can see the whole of the island from up here. But there are ghosts associated with this part of the castle. You've got more than one ghostly lady, haven't you, for a start? Yes, well of course we've got the, the, the white lady who haunts Castle Russian, one of the most famous ghosts of them all. She's often seen down in the dungeon near the entrance area. Yep. We also have the woman in black. She's actually been seen at the top of the castle. And in fact, in the 1960s, three lads, three boys brigade, were on holiday on a camp on the island and they were visiting the castle. They came up here and actually seen this woman stood here with, a, with, a, with like a Victorian dress on, with what they described as dark hands. Now they actually were so frightened by this that they signed a sworn affidavit and handed it to the curator of the museum. Wow, this was up here, on this, this spot, on this, this area? Very, on this very spot. And in fact, during the Second World War, this 
obviously was a medieval outpost and uh, an observation point, was perfect for the home guard. Of course. Now the story that I was told that uh, there were, they used to put two guards up here and looking for Nazi paratroopers, and one of them, one of the home guardsmen, left his rifle downstairs, and he would not go downstairs to get his rifle on his own. He was that frightened of the white, the story of the white lady. Wasn't frightened of the Nazis, but the white lady was a different matter. Crikey. Now, also, obviously, we can see for a long way. Over there um, is the area where they used to hang them. O outside the castle, they used to take them in a cart and then sort of string them up. But, but that area is, well, it's, it's obviously reclaimed land, but there's something else on it now, is there, of some sort? Yeah, it's uh, the timber yard, Coltrose timber yard that's there now, but it was referred to as the lake. And right. This is where the public hangs would happen outside of Castle Rush. And of course, to quote the Victorians, they would get a vast concourse of people yes, that turned up. Sorry. Yes, there is actually a case of, of a double hanging of, a, of a, uh, two lovers that were executed there. 7,000 people came to witness the execution wow. because That's it was so such, such a heinous crime at the time. But of course, later they brought them inside because this was a prison as well, wasn't it? Yes, it was a, a prison, especially during Victorian times. Yeah. Uh, right up to the 18, early 1890s, before they were transferred into a brand new purpose-built prison in, in Douglas, Victoria Road. Barry, we're in the prison chapel. Um, are there any ghosts or anything around this area? Uh, not in the chapel, but just down below is there are dark shadows seen. Really? What, the floor below. In the floor below. Right. Because I mean, I don't know whether you realise this, but um, in this chapel the condemned person's service would be preached before an execution, but to humiliate the poor condemned person or people, they had to actually kneel in front of the altar, in front of an upright open coffin. Um, this was the coffin they'd actually made for themselves in the prison the week before their execution. But apparently you have something even better in here. You have a special item that is peculiar, as far as I know, to the Isle of Man for executions. Yes, the hangman's belt. Right, and, and why is it different to any, anybody else's belt? Well, most prisoners, when they're going to be executed, would be pinioned in a way with a single strap or with rope, either yeah. in front or behind them. This was actually like a body belt with two mitts, basically like a pair of gloves. One, the belt would be put round them and tied at the front. The prisoner's hand would be put behind him into one glove, then the other glove, and a strap. So they would literally be, they were like hangman's mittens, basically. Grief. Something probably unique to the Isle of Man. Just a bit, and you've got, well, one here actually preserved in the glass case. That's just correct. behind yes, you. We do. Wow. Well, I can't cope with this any longer. So, would you like to take this ball and chain, please? C certainly, but. Thank you very much. OK, Barry, now there's rather a, a large, uh, heavy door here leading to somewhere I know not where. Don't like the look of it. What's this then? This is actually. The room where the condemned cell was in. Oh, room wonderful. Was dark this room was actually divided into two. Yep. One room here and another room there. And this was the dark cell. This is where the condemned were kept before their execution. And in fact, the last man to be executed in the Isle of Man, John Kiausch, on the 1st of August 1872, left the dark cell for the last time with William Calcroft, the hangman. Oh, gosh. Went down these steps yeah. into the debtor's yard. To, do, to walk his final steps to the scaffold. Any ghosts? Anything happening here? Strange things have happened in this room. The door mysteriously swings open and shuts on all its own accord. And this is this is a heavy door. It could be the wind or anything like that. These are remember these are old original prison heavy doors. Yeah. These yeah. things don't open and shut on their own. Crikey. And also, we're it's now being converted into a theatre. Yeah. The electrics have a have a, have a tendency of coming on or off. There are some strange things on in this room. Yeah. And this staircase here, yes. this is th obviously there's a tunnel or something that leads through to the debtor's yard. Yes, this has now been bricked up. Right. Originally the steps were going right the way out into the debtor's yard. And this is where they took their final journey, their final down journey. there, through to an appointment with the hangman. Yes, with William Calcroft. And you can go through and have a look. Can we go and see where the gallows were? Yes, we can. Shall we do that? We will. Come on. But not that way. Not this way. <laughs> we'll go this way. Go on then. Now we're back in the condemned cell again because just as we walked out through that door uh, and William was still in here filming, That's right. this door opened it. So we heard the noise, we turned around and came back in. That's Wills is standing looking pale, yes, to say the least. Yeah, is that the only way we can describe it? And that door has opened on its own. Yes. Um, it's very, very heavy. 
as you can see. It is an old original. And uh, there is no way. Now, the amazing thing is that, because that's what we've just been talking about. Exactly. We were talking uh, about and in fact, the reason we were talking about it, because one of the guides told us that the door frequently opens on its own. That's correct. And it has happened to us. No messing about. Quite genuinely, that door has opened on its own. And I think it's time for us all to leave, don't you? I quite agree. Yes. Barry, we've arrived in the debtor's yard. Now, someone died on this spot. That's correct. This is where the scaffold was erected for John Couch's execution. Against the wall here? Yes, records state that it was against the wall by a well. Right, oh gosh, yeah. But as far as we know, his ghost doesn't haunt here. No, not the word, but don't forget that being a condemned man and an executed man, he was buried within the confines of the castle. So he's as happy as he, as he possibly could be. As well, as could yeah, be, yes. but he doesn't haunt the place that we no, know No, he of. doesn't. No. But you have got hauntings around here. Yes, uh, the most famous ghost of Castle Russian is, of course, the White Lady. Right. She haunts the battlements. Around here? Around here, she's been seen. And also, on other occasions, over by the dungeon entranceway. Right. And she's been seen down there as well, in yes, the dungeon? Yes, she's actually was seen by uh, a member of, of the staff in the 1960s when she uh, thought it was a member of the public who'd actually been locked in the castle, went over to check on him. She just vanished. So I think we should go and have a look in the dungeons. Let's go. Come on. Right, here we are. Entrance to the dungeons. And is this is she seen around this area or seen around this area here? That's right. Reported. And of course vanished down there. Down that there. very dark area down there. That's right. I don't like dark. But uh, we've got to go and have a look, haven't we? Certainly. Would you like to go first, Barry? Go on, I'll leave the way. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's very dark, isn't it? It is very dark. Oh boy. Oh I see. This is what it's all about. This is what Haunted Castle is all about. Certainly. Yeah. Dark, dank, dismal dungeons. Yeah. yeah. And it's haunted. And it's haunted the white lady. Right. And I mean, how many people come down here? I mean, obviously schools, visitors are allowed in here. Oh yes, and it's open to the public for accessible heritage in this, this castle. And, and, and do visitors claim to have seen things? Or, or yeah, I mean, we actually have recorded uh, evidence or stories of, of people who have actually been visiting the castle and have seen the white lady and also a grey lady that's been seen wandering around the castle as well. Really? Yes. And do you think it's a different ghost? I or, think it is. Because you see, I'm a great believer in, in this stone tape theory mm -hmm. uh, that, that some of these ghosts are actually nothing but a recording. And over the years, like, like replaying a video over and over again, it fades. So in other words, it starts off as a, as a probably a lady with, with a pink dress and a yellow scarf, and after hundreds of years, it then becomes a white lady, and then it fades even more, and then it perhaps becomes a grey lady, until eventually it's faded away, and you just get footsteps or something. It's a recording, perhaps, but I don't know whether that's the situation here, or, or whether it's a real spirit. Hmm. Nobody knows, but then again, you say that, it, that she's searching, possibly, for a baby. Well, that's the story of the white lady, is the fact that she was executed for the, for the yeah. death of a child. So that is probably a tormented soul, a tormented an entity, uh, an intelligence that is still around. But uh, I'll tell you something, this, is, uh, this place has atmosphere. It's very atmospheric, oh, and yeah. a fantastic castle. Yeah, I mean, I presume it's, it's, I would say, from what you've told me today, it's the most haunted castle on the island. But of course, there is another, isn't there? That's true. Now, Peter, you're not only employed by the castle, but you, you're actually you're dressed as somebody else today. I'm a humble peasant of the 1500s. But the thing is that you've actually seen ghosts here and you've had experiences in this very room. I have quite a few. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes. About five years ago, I had a group of people in the room I was explaining about all the things on the table, all the sweetmeats, what the recipes involved, and all of a sudden there was a rattling of chains against the wall, just there. Everybody heard it, not just me. 
I said to the visitors, excuse me a moment, walked round the table, lifted the hanging and away from the wall, expecting to see a chain. There was nothing. At the end of the room, behind the drape there, there is a door. Went out there, no sound out there whatsoever. The noise was still in the room, but fainter. Then it stopped. When I came back to the table, I said to all the visitors around the table, I'm sorry, it must be our resident, resident ghost. And from the eye contact I've got of some, they thought I got a pedal under the table, pressed the pedal, rattled the chain. It was part of the act. I'm afraid it wasn't. There was no pedal, the noise was there. I went home, wondering about this, whatever it could be. And the only thing I could dream up was, it's a solid wall there, a void in the wall, a chain hung up, and just at the time I was talking to the people, the shackle broke, the chain dropped, clang, 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 till it stopped swinging. Well, Peter, that, that is, that's amazing, that's fantastic. Um, wonderful stories. We'll uh, let you get off now, because obviously your children are waiting for you. We went on a trek to see if we could find the Dolby Spook to a place called Dawlish Cashin, one of the remotest farmhouses in the whole of the British Isles. In 1931, a young girl called Vori Irving started hearing strange noises, rappings and tappings. She reckoned that there was a mongoose in the cavities between the walls and the oak panelling in the house. Eventually, she said she could even talk to the mongoose, and it used to talk back to her. This story became so famous that the world-famous paranormal investigator Harry Price came over to the Isle of Man to investigate. The story dragged on for nearly five years and became one of the most famous poltergeist stories of all time. I think we've reached Dawlish Cashin. I believe we've, well, yes. What we do you think, Alan? I think we have. It's certainly looking promising. Um, but we need some stone. There's a well. There's a well somewhere. It's supposed to be a well close to the property. What's this? Stones. More stones. More brick. Oh, look. Uh-huh. There you go. Is that a well or is that a well? That is a well. That's definitely a well. They're made in Dolby. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> Dolby, anyway. Ah, right, Dolby. So th this has got to be it. Now look, there's one thing left, just to prove it. Gooseberry bushes. Right. Well, they would they would be in the garden or the garden. Well, that's area. what they said. All that's yeah. left is a, is a, um, a, a well. Yeah. Um, a post, a solitary post, some corrugated iron. Well, there's an old barn. Look up there. Yeah. Sense. And gooseberry bushes. The thing about it is, it's going to have to be sort of flat anyway, because you don't have a property on it. Yeah, and you've you know. got what looks like a platform. Makes sense, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Come on, let's go and find the gooseberry bushes, shall we? Okay. Oh. You know what? I wouldn't. I wouldn't know a gooseberry bush if I fell in one. Are they? Gooseberry bushes or not? They certainly are. Oh, they? Why, and also, why would gooseberry bushes be grown up here? I don't know. But hang on a minute. Why aren't there any gooseberries on them? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that what they are? Yeah. What else are they? I don't know, because they're totally different to anything else we've seen. So we found the front garden. Right. Do you think the Irving's front garden? Yeah. Yes. Now come on, lads. This is this is going to be your claim to fame. Uh, you know, you're the Manx Paranormal Society, and you've come all this way out to investigate the Dorby Spook, as it was known, because yep. people said it was supernatural. They said that it was possibly a poltergeist, or if not, then some form of familiar to do with witchcraft. Yeah. And at times, Geff also said that he was a spirit. So. Here we are, you've sung a part of uh, Alan Vannin. Is that how you say it? Mm. Yeah. I keep saying that. You've sung a part of Alan Vannin, which is the Manx National Song, which Geff used to sing here. And here we are sitting very close to the farmhouse that was known as Dawlish Cashin. 
where one of the most famous poltergeist stories of all time took place. There's nothing left, it's all gone. Mm. Is he still around? I mean, I'll tell you what, hair on the back of my neck standing up now, just talking about it, because I've read so much about it. And I wonder, was Harry Price, that was a cow, was Harry Price bonkers? Or, or did he believe in the story? I don't know. But there's only one thing to do, because it's getting very dark now, and I don't know how we're going to find a way back, but we've just got to sort of try and do something to see if Geth's around. So I don't know. Um, just have to ask out, don't we? Make fools of ourselves. Geth! Are you here? <laughs> Geff, the talking mongoose. Do you believe you're doing this, Richard Felix? Do you really believe you're doing this? Come on, Geff, you were friendly, you were happy. You befriended the Irving family on this site for four years. They believed in you. If you're here, if you still dwell around this area, if you're still catching rabbits, we've come to see you. Like so many people from England came over to see you all those years ago. Will you give us a sign? Will you tell us that you're here still? Tell us that you really did exist. Speak to us. Geff, sing us a song. Tell me what I had for my breakfast. Tell us what sort of fruit Mrs Irving put in the cupboard. Give us a sign if you are really around, if you really did exist, if you're still alive, or if you're a spirit. Talk to us now. Give us the... <laughs> Geff, was that you? <laughs> There's another bit for the outtakes, folks. Geff had beans for That was not a sign. <laughs> the old wind's getting up. <laughs> Come on, Geff. It's all get, it's getting good now. There's there's a lot of emotion here. We're happy. You were happy. One last chance before we leave. Geff, did you exist? Or did you only exist in the mind of the Irving family? and in the mind of Harry Price and Captain MacDonald and R.S. Lambert. Come on, Geff, are you there? Geff, can you hear me? I think the jury's still out, gentlemen, at the moment. Looks like it. Certainly is. Back to civilization. Back if we can to find it. Come on, then. Now then, Alan, this is a rather windy, bleak spot. This is St Patrick's Isle. We're overlooking Peel, and this is Peel Castle. Now, you feature this, don't you, on your Peel Ghost Walk? Of course. No ghost walk would be the same without it. It's Peel Castle is, is home to the most famous ghost in Peel, if not the Isle of Man. The more they do. It's not really a ghost, but a supernatural black dog. Research shows we actually have six supernatural black dogs here on the island. But Peel's is by far the worst, reported of the size of a Newfoundland dog with blood red eyes and very long fangs. This story dates back to 1666. Whether 666 and number of the beast has anything to do with this, we can only hope yes. Like but this it. is when the castle was guarded by a garrison of soldiers. Now the soldiers' last job at night was to lock up the two main entrances which lead into the castle. Easy job to do, should have taken no more than three minutes by one guard. But three guards always used to do this. Three for they feared, feared the more to do. This dog would materialise at dusk, but it would disappear at dawn. Nobody knew where it came from, nobody knew where it went to, but it always demanded the utmost of respect. If it went into one of the guards' room when the guards were inside, they'd stop talking, stop drinking, stop smoking, or they would just leave the room. If they went outside, the dog was laid across one of the paths, the soldiers actually walk in the mud. This is how much they feared it. Gosh. Anyway, one evening a local soldier by the name of Dewan Quayle decided he was going to show everybody how brave he was by taking this task upon himself. The others tried to talk him out of it, but he refused. As he picked up the keys, he walked out the guard room door, he closed the door behind him. As I said, it should have taken no more than three minutes, but it was over an hour later before they heard his screams of pain coming from the other side of the closed guard room door. Wow. And that was actually down there, 
that guard room. That guard room just there. Shall we uh, go and have a look and see if he's oh, in there now? Definitely. Come on then. Down the hill. We're in the guard room. It's a bit spooky. Um, very echoey to say the least. And with us in the middle of the floor is the more the do or a model of it. Yeah. But this is the actual guard room now. Yeah. This is the guard room that Jimin left. Right. And he was in here on guard duty with others. Yeah. Left through the door, obviously. Yep. And it was an hour later. Before they heard his screams of pain coming through the side of the door. Gosh. But still they refused to open the door, for if they did, <coughs> the dog would come inside and attack them. Another half hour passed before the door finally opened. In walked Dewan. His clothes resembled his flesh, both torn away from his body, and he was covered in blood from head to toe. The other soldiers asked him what had happened. He refused to say a word. They tried to bandage him up. He just pushed them away. They tried to give him food, they tried to give him water, they even tried to give him beer, and he'd have none of it. All he wanted to do was to sit on a wooden stool and stare into the flames of the open fire, which is what he did continuously for three days, until suddenly he fell off his stool, he landed on the floor, and he was dead. This is where the legend starts. If you see them all to do, you will die shortly afterwards. And that was actually here. It was in this very in room. This room. My now, it's strange, because there are stories of, of black dogs with yellow saucer eyes or red staring eyes um, throughout the British Isles, um, Black Shuck, um, Padfoot, Bar Guests, Gitrash, and of course here in the Isle of Man, yeah. More the Do. They're all harbingers of death. Mm. Um, but I mean, wh where do you think it comes from? This probably dates back from the Viking times, where myths and legends used to rule, and of course the larger animal, the bigger the saga and the story. Of course, yeah but a story or a saga that is obviously very famous and, as you've already said, one of, the, one of the most famous ghost stories on the Isle of Man. It has to be. Fantastic. Right, I've actually plucked up the courage and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking to more than do. But uh, it's very strange because while we've been here at the castle, um, it's not a particularly windy day, but wherever we've been filming and interviewing, there seems to have been a... Um, a wind sound at the back of us and even in here and this is totally enclosed there's there's a sound like the wind in here um, it's nothing there is nothing wrong with with the sound of the camera or anything else but for for all the time we're here we get this strange psychic breeze for some reason what it is I don't know we're obviously going to take the the footage away and try and analyze it and see what's wrong but Paranormal? I don't know. If you'd like to come down here, Richard, I'll take him to the scariest part of the castle. Oh, see what you mean. My Alan, we're, we're probably in the spookiest part of Peel Castle. Um, I certainly wouldn't like to be down here on my own. Uh, what, what goes on down here? Well, we're in the crypt of the castle now. This is used as a prison up from the 14th to the 18th century. Quite a lot of people were held down here. Yeah. It's where the last two people were trial for witchcraft were held down here as well. And this is also where the staff don't like to come down as well. Many times they've been down here, they felt someone stood behind them, or they've seen shadows on the wall. Right. And, and um, as far as we know, it isn't actually, well, haunted by any specific person. The, the, the two, I presume it was women that were, were sentenced for witchcraft. Mostly women, yeah. yeah. But they weren't executed, were they? No, not executed here. No, and, and I'm told that that's because of the, the, the horrors of what happened um, in Castletown, when yeah. they actually burnt one of the witches, and, and I think a child as well. That's right. Uh, and so they actually stopped burning witches yeah. in, 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 on the Isle of Man. But I mean, you see, I'm a great believer in in this stone tape business where this is sandstone. Yeah. And, and when you think of the, the terrors and the traumas um, of people that must have been incarcerated down here, mm. I, I think that, that people see and, and hear um, echoes from the past that are actually, for want of a better word, recorded into the fabric of, of the building, into the stone. And I reckon one day we'll probably find a way of unleashing it in exactly the same way as pressing the replay button of your video player, Yeah, I think they'll be able to unleash all the, the sounds and the traumas that, were actually, that are recorded in a place like this. 
Well, if it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be the place because these walls are some four, five, six foot thick and we're surrounded by sandstone. Exactly. And as I say, the, the amount of, of, of terror that, that must still be encapsulated down here for all those poor people that were, you know, incarcerated here for hundreds of years. It must have been the closest form to hell you could get on, on, would, on the earth, I suppose. I would think so, yeah. Roy, you're the curator of the Lease Peel Life Museum. Um, it's situated in the old courtroom. Down below you've actually got the original cells, the dungeons. But what exactly do you do here? What is it all about? Well, the Lease Museum, the Museum of uh, Peel Life, we have many artefacts relating to the maritime history of Peel uh, and articles relate, relating to the Narcalo prison of war camp. Now, during the Second World War, they called them internees. First World War, they're still prisoners of war, even though they were civilians. Oh. And they, they were from all walks of life, whether they were sailors, whether they were bankers, whether they were uh, uh, butchers or bakers. They came from all walks of life. Now, we also have um, plenty of interest on the bits and pieces we have, we've collected from uh, uh, the police, for instance. Yes. Yeah. We have the, the birch and stool. Mm. All sorts of items, in fact, that are to do with the life of, of, of Peel. But, but you've actually also got, well, a very spooky, a ghostly shoe, yeah? Well, this shoe, yes. A man called Keith Crompton, who was renovating the building which is next door to the Leash Museum, which right. was the bishop's house, or the bishop's residence in yes, Peel. Yes, yes. And uh, this shoe was uh, uh, found bricked up in a chimney spot chimney place. Yep. Now these shoes uh, were, or the sh shoes were bricked up in many houses, whether it was a roof space, whether it was a window, whether it was a doorway, whether it was an arch, anywhere that evil or witchcraft could get in. Gotcha. So they, uh, they put these in. Now when Keith found the shoe, yeah. he sent it off to a museum to be carbon dated yeah. on the internet, mm. found a museum who did this stuff. So he sent this shoe off and lo and behold, when he received them, there was a pair of shoes. Now this... You're kidding. I'm not kidding at all. This, so, as they say, freaked Keith out. I mean, they are the same. They are a pair, aren't they? They are a pair of shoes. There's no... Now, <laughs> whoever had these kept them for a long, long time because... I look at the holes in them. Look at the holes in them. I say, that is quite amazing. So nobody knows how or, or, or why, but one went, two came and back. two came back. Wow. Now tell me... Is this place haunted? Well, I'm not too sure if it's haunted. I have a security camera which I set from 12 o'clock until 6. Yes. And the, uh, uh, when I reset the camera, never, never again I'll look at it. And I, I, mm, uh, mm. I watched the, uh, the film one particular day. Yes. We have this um, rocking horse. Yes. Which I'll walk past and I'll just get to the doorway as I'm walking into my office and yeah. I'll see it move. Now, whether it's subconsciously I've touched it, I don't know. But occasionally, this would happen. So, yep. Maybe it is. Uh, well, you see, so. you see, people always do that. They actually make out that they think they've done it themselves, because the mind can't cope with something supernatural might be moving it. So you convince yourself that you must have bumped into it or oh. touched it with your hand as you've gone by. But the thing is, did, did you? I? Nobody will probably ever know, will they? No, we will not. Sorry. Thanks. We're in Peel, in what's reputedly the oldest street on the whole of the Isle of Man. Now, this is one of your many haunts on your Peel Ghost Walk. That's all right. We're now in Castle Street, which is the oldest street on the island. Yeah. It used to be called Big Street about 100 years ago. Since we first started doing the walk, we've been told on three occasions by previous owners of a property down this street that they've been woken by icy cold hands trying to strangle them in the middle of the night. Say, so three, three people have told us this, there's got to be something in it. Yeah, too right. We also know it's the same house as well. It belonged to the parents of an 18-year-old girl. Now, she was due to go out with her friends from Douglas. They were going to come down, pick her up, and take her back for the night out. She got ready, she got dressed, and when she was finally ready, she started to walk downstairs, but she only got halfway downstairs before Uncle John stopped her by putting his hand across to the wall. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to say a word, but she could tell something was up. So she went back upstairs to her room and shouted down to her parents that she'd changed her mind, she wasn't going out. Her mother asked why, she refused to say. They tried to phone her friends up in Douglas, but too late, they'd already left. 
They came down, knocked on the door, said, is she ready? I said, I'm sorry, she's not coming out tonight. So Fence got back in the car and they headed off back to Douglas. Halfway back to Douglas, around Greber Bridge, there was a wagon coming the other way and it was on the wrong side of the road. But thankfully it saw them almost in time and it only clipped to the side of the car. But it did send the car spinning quite badly into a tree. Now the police said it was a good job no one was sat in the back of this car because if they had been they would have been injured if not killed. Now this is where that girl would have sat if Uncle John hadn't have seen her. But why is she so scared about seeing Uncle John? Uncle John had actually died three years before. Oh, <clears> gosh. Yeah. Now I get given stories right round the island, not just Peel, right round the island. And I can tell when somebody's telling me a story, if I look them in the eye, I can tell how truthful they're being. The lady who told me this story had a look in her eye like I've never seen before. So she was definitely telling the truth as far as I'm aware. Now, 31st of October, Hopchin or Halloween. Yes. As you can imagine, as you probably know, busiest night of the year for yep. the ghost walks. Last year, we had a photographer down from the newspapers. He was taking pictures of us. As we'd finished, we started to walk up this street. He said, I've got to go shortly, but can I have a quick word with you? I said, yes. Yeah. I, I used to rent that house till about five years ago. Only rented it for six weeks, he said, while our, our house was being completed. I said, did you experience anything in that back room? He said, we didn't, but the first two nights, it was our children's room. But they refused to sleep in there on the third night because they said the naughty ghost children would come and wake them up. He said, how did the naughty ghost children used to wake your children up? He said, I don't know, they're too young at the time to ask you questions like that. So we moved them out of that room. He said, anyway, they're five years older now. If they're still up when I get back, I'll ask them. If you remember anything, I'll phone you tomorrow. I said, oh, thank you. Half past ten the same night my phone goes. He said, I can't wait to tell you till tomorrow. I said, why? I said, I saw my children when I got home. Did you remember the house in Castle Street? I said, yeah. Did you remember your old bedroom? I said, yes. Yeah. Do you remember the naughty ghost children? At which point his two children looked at each other and said, yeah, we remember them. Said, How did the naughty ghost children used to wake you up? I said, they would come into our room at night and put their icy cold hands under the sheets and they would touch us all over. Eventually, they'd get to our necks and try and strangle us. Flipping heck. Mm. Oh, I said, that, I mean, that's <laughs> all just come from, from people that have been on your ghost walks yep. or that, that have got to know you because of ghosts. Because yep. they know what you and do. all from first hand experiences. That is absolutely amazing. That's a, that's a chiller. Mm. And it's a house, house somewhere. House just down the street. Obviously, we don't want to say where it is no, because of people are living here It's now. occupied now, yeah. But who knows when, when you'll get the next report from somebody on one of your ghost walks yeah. about that house. That is amazing. Mm. Fantastic. Alan, thanks very much. My, my pleasure, Richard. Thank you. I'm standing on Tinwald Hill. This is the seat of Manx government and also of Manx justice. And talking of justice, or rough justice, any witches that were found on the Isle of Man were always taken to the top of that mountain, Slewellian Mountain. In those days, there were no trees up there. It's 1,090 feet high. They were sealed into a barrel, at least 10 spikes driven into the barrel, and then they were rolled the 1,090 feet down to the bottom of the mountain. If they died, they were innocent. If they lived, they were a witch. And they were taken away and either burnt at the stake or hanged. Lesser witches, were actually condemned here in the Isle of Man to spend the rest of their days living on that very mountain. I wonder if any of those tormented souls are still on that mountain to this very day. I'm just walking out of one of the most tragic houses that I've ever been into. This is a very remote farmhouse at Dawlish Ard. James Killier, his wife and five daughters lived here. James Killier and three of his daughters died here. Um, nobody really knows what happened. It was 1868 and James took himself off down to Glen May. He didn't drink but he seemed to come back drunk, but a very different person. As the weeks went by, he, he became even more melancholy. His wife was very concerned as to what was wrong with him. And then one day, the children were playing outside. 
he went over to a cabinet and took out his cutthroat razor which concerned his wife terribly. He was in a very, very strange frame of mind so she sent one of the daughters, Emily, down to fetch her brother. She went and took the youngest child, who was only three months old, out of the cot and then heard screams coming from outside here in the garden. Two screams of Dada, Dada. She rushed outside with the baby to see her husband James throwing his children down the well. Throwing them down a well which is actually covered up now completely but is just over here. Uh, just wander over to the site where four people died in 1868. His wife rushed over here with the baby still in her arms to try and stop him. He'd already thrown two of the children down the well. He wrestled with his wife, screaming to her that they were all going to go together. He pulled the baby out of her arms and threw the baby down just at the moment when the daughter Emily, who'd been trying to find her uncle, came back, he rushed over, grabbed hold of Emily and threw her down here as well. And he then jumped in on top of them. And I'm standing on, on, on the top of where the well was. Um, most tragic sight I think I've ever, I've ever been to. Um, Emotion's almost too much, it really is. Um, the brother came along and actually went down the rope in the bucket, grabbed one of the girls, came back up the rope and dropped her back down again. And he had to go down a second time to bring her out. He actually brought three of the children out, two of which lived. The baby was dead. James was dead, and two of the other girls were dead as well. Um, I don't know, it's, uh, it's awful to even stand here. No wonder the place is, is derelict and, and empty. The following was reported in a local newspaper. An air of solemn, sombre and oppressive silence hangs over the spot. Not a policeman or other officer of the law is yet to be seen. No gaping crowds have penetrated thither to satisfy that craving for the horrible which is inherent in human nature. At the door of the cottage stands a little girl, some five years old, who gazes about her with a timid, half-frightened air, as well she may, poor child, having been one of those rescued from such imminent peril of death. And there is another report as well, telling of the scene inside the house. If I dare go in. There sits a woman whose frame is convulsed with the agony of grief, while at a little distance from her are two fine little girls, one about five, the other about two years of age. We turn into a room on the left, and there, stretched on the humble bed, covered with white counterpane, which is rivalled in colour by the faces of the dead, are four bodies, a father and his three daughters. The father is a man of some three and thirty years, a handsome man. Beside him is his infant daughter, Madeline. Next is the elder daughter, Selina nearly seven years of age. Last, Louisa, about four years of age. Hard indeed would be a heart unmoved by such a touching spectacle. I'm sitting in a little churchyard on the main Douglas to Peel Road. It's very busy, it's very noisy, but this tranquil little churchyard surrounding the church of Old Kirk Braddon. It's haunted. And inside there, 
four people have reported seeing a gentleman kneeling in front of the altar wearing a long dark coat, a wide brimmed hat and under his arm is a Bible. He's believed to be one of the Parsons but the strange thing is he's always seen levitating. He's about three feet above the floor. Now this church goes back to the 13th century and I wonder if this apparition that's seen here is actually seen kneeling on the old floor that was possibly three feet higher than what the floor is now. But the real reason I'm here is for the gentleman that's next to me, Robert Cooley. He was hanged for sheep stealing on the 5th of June 1818. Now I've had to come all the way to the Isle of Man to see the grave and the gravestone of a hanged man because normally they were not allowed to be buried in consecrated ground. Murderers were either gibbeted or publicly dissected. But this heinous crime of sheep stealing, which was a hanging offence, you were then allowed to be brought to a churchyard, given back to your family, who buried you with the rest of them. And I can see here there are other members of the Cooley family buried here with him. The amazing thing is that legend has it that he actually owned half of that sheep. So I'm actually sitting next to the gravestone of a man who was hanged for stealing half a sheep. I've just popped into the church to have a look and tell you something, it's well worth a visit, not only to see the ghost, but also to see these incredible Celtic and Viking stones that have been found, I presume, around the graveyard. They're now on display. But you can't read the inscription on Robert Cooley's gravestone, but they've got it printed here inside the church. So I'll just read it to you. Sacred to the memory of Robert Cooley of Ballacrink in this parish, who departed this life on the 5th day of June 1818, in the 51st year of his age. Far from a world of grief and sin, with God eternally shut in. I'm just chilling out in the Dickens bar at the Castle Mona in uh, Douglas. Um, whenever I come over to the Isle of Man, I, I always stay here. And of course, there's a very good reason for it. It's haunted. Uh, the room I'm in now is haunted by a lady in a green dress. She's seen here in the Dickens bar and also in the ballroom. Nobody knows who she is, but she wanders through these rooms and disappears through the wall. The building was erected by the fourth Duke of Athol in 1798. He was the governor of the Isle of Man and he chose this, this place, this area, as his residence, but for some strange reason, we don't know why, after 30 years he sold it and it became a private residence until eventually, of course, it became one of the best hotels on the island. It's got other ghosts as well. There's a very strange tunnel that seems to go all the way around the perimeter of the building like a moat. Strange things have happened in there and the staff don't like to go in there on their own. There's a tower, obviously right at the top of the building. No light bulbs in any of the sockets, but frequently people in the town see a light on, like a beacon in the top of the tower. But there's no possibility, no light bulbs there at all. Probably the most haunted part of the place, room 212. Haunted by two little children often seen, reported by guests staying here, who sometimes come down and say, who are the two children that we've seen in the bedroom? Or, could we please move to another room for the next night? And once a builder, staying here for quite a while, had been in there for a few nights, woken in the middle of the night to see these two little children standing at the foot of his bed. He's not the sort of person to make up stories, he came straight down to reception and said, I'd like another room, please. So, to be quite honest with you, 
if you're looking for a haunted hotel on the Isle of Man, if you're looking for a haunted bedroom, then it has to be room 212 in the Castle Mona Hotel in Douglas. Now, we've got a scoop here, but we've got to be very quick. Someone is actually staying in this room, and they don't know about the ghosts. We're going to have a very quick look. Open the door, girls, quick. Is it the right key? Yes. Oh, right. Hello? Could you imagine if someone answered? Wow. We're actually in the haunted bedroom. No, the haunted bedroom's through here. And if you just come through here very quickly, before anybody comes, that's the room, and that's where the two little girls stand at the foot of the bed. Very cold in here. Yes. And yet it's so hot outside. Lovely. Where do you want the flash lamp to be? Just so we can see. What's around this corner? I think you can get out, but I'm not quite sure. I'm sure one of the guys that used to do the maintenance said there is a tunnel. It can, it does lead, but does I'm not sure where to. Does it lead up to, to where the staff quarters was? Is this the tunnel? I'm not sure. You, you, if you just carry on, what I am getting quite brave. If you just carry on, walking. Are you coming? It's freezing down here. There's, oh. there's two. There's two bodies. One's bricked up, and one's. Um, I don't know what the other one is. He's scared as well. <laughs> No, it's just not like down there. It's, is kind of, it? it's waterlogged down there. Is it? Is it? Yeah, there's like there's bin bags and water down there. It's we about, had it a flood, yeah, we had to clean the drains out yesterday. Yeah, that'll be it. But apparently you're not supposed to come in here because the, the says shut the door, they don't want anybody in here. Because it's... We better get out then, seriously. But that's what this well, is. No, it was the lady, it wasn't the boss, it was the lady that says get out of there, they don't want them in there. So you wouldn't go in there, girls, on your own? Oh, no. No? No? And no. um, what is it specifically? Do you get, do you get a, a, a feeling or...? Just not... We were just told never to just keep that door closed. Well, that's what we were told by the medium lady. She says, just keep that door closed. Do not open it because of the evil spirits in there. It's a bit so, cold, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But that could be the break, couldn't it? Yeah, I'm still quite brave going in there. <laughs> but <laughs> you're brave in numbers. Brave That's in numbers. it, yeah. But definitely not on your own. Quite good. Uh, yeah. No. I'm in what I believe to be the jewel in the crown, certainly of Douglas and, and of the Isle of Man. This is the Gaiety Theatre, um, one of Frank Matcham's masterpieces. And with me, um, Mervyn, Neil, and, and Derek. Um, Mervyn, you, you've actually worked here, you've run the place for the past 40 years. Is there something here? I think a theatre is a very special place and during the course of its life, its working life, there's a great deal of passion. Yes. Which is um, bent on the stage, both on it and behind it, and uh, sometimes with the staff at the front of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this has been going on continuously in this building now for 105 years. Wow. And um, I think it is a, f a fairly good suggestion that there might be residents here that um, haven't quite left us. Mm, yeah. And in the, in the 40 years you've been here, things have happened to you? Have you, have you seen anything or sensed anything? Oh, I think we, we've all, everybody that works at the theatre has sensed and, and seen things uh, during their time here. Mm. Um, they happen when you least expect them to happen. Always, yes. You Probably know, in the daytime. Usually in the daytime and usually during performance as well. They like appearing during performances. But you never actually see anything um, untoward. It never, it never worries me at all when no. it accepts them as, uh, as, as members of the public. Right. And, and in your, your times here, you've, you've seen things, have you? Or, or um, yes, yes, I, be I believe mm. I've seen things. I'm not going to say I have, I believe I've seen things. Um, I can't prove I have, but my, uh, I believe I've seen things, yes. Really? Yes. And, and what about the two of you? I mean, Neil, have you, have anything happened to you here? I've not seen anything, but I've certainly felt something as if, you know, there is something there. Um, but certainly nothing bad. Oh, no, you know, th in fact, there aren't warm. bad things, to be honest with you. Especially in a place like this, you couldn't yeah. have anything bad, I don't no, think. No, it's a very friendly place. Yeah. And I think, you know, whatever is here just loves the place, as we do. Yeah. What about Derek? I mean, anything against 
No, anywhere? I've not actually seen anything, but uh, you, you do get this feeling of comfort and enjoyment. And I think this is, comes, again, as Mervyn has said, what comes off the stage, because it is their joy of giving, and they are still giving, and they're giving to us and anybody else that wishes to take an interest in the theatre. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's very nice to know that you're welcome. I think it's a lovely part of this job, that you can be here on your own and have no worries whatsoever, because yeah. you know that you're being looked after. That's amazing. That's really nice. Yeah, that's super. So, so the place is, is very much still, obviously, a place of entertainment, but some of those people from the past that love this place so much, for some reason, are still here, keeping, keeping a watch over you, making sure that everything's running just as smoothly as it always has done. Oh, very much so. Mm. Uh, and, and indeed, in fact, uh, sometimes when people pass over, they actually ask, how the remains buried here? Really? And, uh, we have interred one or two people below the stage so they request their ashes be, be walled up in the building so, uh, who knows they probably are still here that's amazing gentlemen thank you very much indeed thank, thank, you. thank you i'm on the new castle town road and i'm on the fairy bridge now the isle of man is absolutely steeped in history in myths and legends the irish have the leprechauns but here they have the fairies, known as themselves. It's essential that whenever you come over this bridge, you have to greet the fairies for good luck. If it's morning, afternoon or evening, you have to respond to them. It's now 10 past 12, so I have to say good afternoon fairies. And I'm hoping that it will bring me good luck while I'm on the island. Perhaps we may find a ghost while we're here. But people that are attending the TT come here and ask for good luck. And in recent times, people have started pinning messages and leaving things behind on the trees here. And I've just pulled one off the tree and it actually says, Dear fairies, give my Uncle John luck on Friday on his race at the Manx and please keep him safe. All my love, Amy. Well, I've arrived back at Ronald's Way Airport and behind me for the last time, the three legs of man. I've had three incredible days filming and searching for some of the most marvellous ghost stories that I've ever heard. I just hope that you've enjoyed watching this DVD as much as I've enjoyed making it. I hope it wasn't too scary and just remember, that eight out of ten ghost stories can be explained. It's the other two you've got to worry about. Do sleep well, don't have nightmares, and as the Manx say, Slenlat. <laughs>